hello in part four of my cost of capital series we're going to put it all together and show the calculation of the weighted average cost of capital which as I show here is the weighted average cost of debt RD and RE the cost of common equity notice that each cost component uh, is weighted by the percentage of money generated from that particular a source. So WD represents the debt ratio and WE represents the equity ratio. And not to forget that the effective cost of debt to a firm is the after-tax cost of debt represented here where RD cost of debt is multiplied by 1 minus the corporate tax rate. Remembering that interest paid on debt is tax deductible. Alright, so now if the firm has preferred stock, which is rare, then we're going to have to throw in the uh, weighted components of the cost of preferred stock. Now though, the task ahead of us is to determine how we figure out WD and WE, which define the firm's capital structure, the mix of debt and equity capital invested in the firm. And remembering that total capital is equal to debt plus equity, it means therefore that if we find WD debt ratio to be 40%, then automatically we know that equity ratio is going to be 60%. If debt ratio is say 20%, then equity ratio is going to be 80%. All right, and so um, how do we go about determining the debt ratio so as to calculate the weighted average cost of capital? Two ways to go about this. One is to use book values, which are basically balance sheet values, and the other is to use market value weights, all right, market values. So using book value, for example, we're going to have to be calculating what's called the book value capital structure. And what we're going to do is to go to the balance sheet and identify the investor supplied capital investor supplied capital you ask well remember an investor is someone who puts money into a project or in this case a firm with the expectation to receive a return and income on that investment and so if you lend money to a firm say in the form of short-term debt of course you're gonna get paid interest so that you are an investor you can also lend money to the firm long term and as well you're gonna receive uh, interest income so debt holders are investors likewise equity holders of course common equity holders um, are the basic investors of the firm because they own the firm and they are expecting the firm to pay them dividends and if not dividends at least um, to run the firm successfully so as to provide them with the opportunity of a capital gain in the future and so debt holders and equity holders are the firm's investors and the money they provided are going to be regarded as investor supplied capital which I've highlighted here in blue you may say what's up with accruals and payables these are spontaneously generated accounts they are not investor supplied and therefore will not be included in the firm's capital structure you might also ask, should short-term debt be included in the firm's capital structure? Well, in this example, I include it. Now, the answer to that, perhaps, is that if a firm uses short-term debt um, a, on a recurring basis, then, of course, it behooves you to include it, because to not do so would be undercounting the firm's uh, interest-bearing liabilities. If on the other hand it's a hit or miss whereby the firm uses short-term debt of uh, maybe debt of six months uh, maturity and rarely does so in the future or at any other time then if that's the case you really would should do well not to include it because to do so is to assume that the firm intends to uh, on a recurring basis utilize short-term debt as part of its capital structure but again in this example as I show here uh, we're including short-term debt because we believe it is a permanent fixture in the firm's um, debt structure and so total interest-bearing debt here would be sixty thousand dollars the sum of these two and for common equity it's going to be forty thousand dollars and I go back here at common equity would include the common stock 
yeah. money generated at the outset when shares were sold and any retained earnings which are portions of the profits over the years that have been plowed back into the firm so that combines to be what we refer to as common equity so total investor supplied capital here would be a hundred thousand bucks so now find the debt ratio which as I explained right here is simply the amount of debt um, divided by in total investor supplied capital is going to be 60 percent and of course uh, one minus that amount would be 40 percent or you can also calculate it directly as I represent right here so this is going to be a book value capital structure so that together with the data on the firm's component costs of debt and equity and the tax rates we can go ahead and uh, hook it all up and find the weighted average cost of capital to be 7.32 percent and then we're going to use this to determine uh, we're going to use this in valuation but you see though the problem with this book value capital structure as I explain right here is that it uses historical data on the balance sheets which do not reflect current market values for example if I go back here a little bit this uh, long-term debt might have been issued say 10 years ago when interest rate was let's say 8% and now interest rate might be 12% or maybe lower at 3% or something like that so you can see that the value of this forty thousand dollars of debt is going to be different to today than it was several years ago when the company issued this uh, debt likewise this stock that you see here may be selling at a radically different price today than it did when the firm uh, first issued it and so we have to be sure to remember that the essence of cost of capital estimation is to obtain a cost of capital that reflects what the current cost of generating debt and equity capital today is and therefore we would do better to use market value capital structure instead of book value capital structure what that means is identifying these two capital components debt and equity we want to go out right now and find how much they are worth right now so for example let's say that the stock is currently selling for fifty dollars and let's say that the short-term debt that you see here really the rate the rate on it hasn't changed let's assume it still is five percent that tells us that uh, don't bother changing the value from twenty thousand bucks all right because short-term debt is debt with maturity of less than a year so we, we shouldn't expect the interest rate on it to change dramatically within a space of 12 months we should however expect the interest rate on long-term debt to change quite a bit in this case the firm has forty thousand bonds and of course when bonds are first issued they are issued at par so that for each bond the firm borrows a thousand bucks so the face value of the bond which is also the bonds future value is a thousand dollars at the time the bond was issued coupon interest rate was eight percent so the interest that bondholders are receiving periodically is based on eight percent of a thousand bucks this bond currently has a maturity of 12 years and right now market interest rate is 7% as you can see which is different from the coupon rate at the time the bond was issued if it had still been 8% then no worries we're gonna stay with uh, the forty thousand dollars of debt but with this rate changing we need to recalculate the market value of the debt and that's what I did right here so if you want a refresher on bond valuation you can go and uh, check out my bond valuation series but I'm gonna do that real quickly right here remember to find value we need to identify the cash flows which is gonna be these two guys right here the phase value of the coupon rate then we need to know what the maturity of the bond is and finally we need to know what the yield to maturity is and we're gonna base it on uh, semi-annual data which is what you see right here all right so with that bringing up my BA2 plus which is the calculator I've used throughout the series you want to go second you clear this TVM here and you click second and you clear work all right that's a ritual you must perform so I'm gonna type in 1000 as you see right here that's the phase value and 40 that's payment and then we're gonna go 24 which is the semi number of a uh, semi annual periods that's in and then 3.5 which is the uh, semi annual yield to maturity that's i over y and so we can compute pv all right to remove the negative here just click this key right here plus minus key and that's your 
that's your price right there and so all we got to do is to take this price per bond and multiply it by the total number of bonds of 40,000 bucks and this tells us that the current market value of the bonds is 43.2 million the short-term debt is still 20,000 so adding the two gives us a total market value of interest bearing debt to be 43.2 million for the common equity stock price is 50 there are 2 million shares of stock outstanding all right if I go back here you can see it's shown it on the firm's balance sheet right here all right so that means therefore that we're gonna multiply fifty dollars per share by the total number of shares outstanding to get a hundred million bucks adding this forty three point two million to a hundred million we get the total market value of debt and equity of hundred and forty three point two million so that the market value debt ratio is going to be 30 percent which is 43.2 divided by 143.2 and therefore the market value equity ratio is 70 percent which is 100 divided by 143.2 armed with these two vital pieces of data as I show here we recalculate the weighted average cost of capital and find that to be 8.66 percent which we can then utilize in the valuation of the underlying project or for that matter the firm and ladies and gentlemen that's a wrap hope you enjoyed it